This morning we're going to look at 2 Kings 4, verse 42 to 44. It's not a long passage, and it's not an expected passage on Palm Sunday. The expected passage is the one that we already read. But we've been working through uh, the stories of Elisha in 2 Kings, and if you haven't been here, that's why we're going to read this passage this morning. It's because of the series we're in, and it does connect in the end, although it'll take a few minutes to get there. So I'd like to go to 2 Kings uh, chapter 4, and it's 42 through 44, and you see the title is there, The Feeding of a Hundred. A man came from Baal Shelisha, bringing the man of God, that is Elisha, 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. Uh, how can I set it before a hundred men? His servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. And appropriately, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So this uh, miracle is a little bit maybe underwhelming because perhaps we're thinking of the New Testament miracle. Uh, let's not do that video. You've got to wait about 10 minutes for that. Um, we're thinking of the New Testament miracle, right? Where Jesus fed about 5,000 people and it was just totally amazing. We're thinking of this, 100 people, well, let's do the math. There's 20 loaves of bread. I think that's five, uh, cut every loaf and five pieces and you feed 100 people and that would have worked, right? I mean, but... Obviously, it's a miracle if it's in the Old Testament. And this is one of the things that was recorded as a supernatural thing that happened around the ministry of Elisha. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Bible. Of course, barley doesn't have much gluten in it, so it doesn't get very big, and it probably little loaves. In any case, they cut this up, and there's some left over. It's a miracle of provision. Perhaps we're looking at it from 3,000 years away. It's not that big, but certainly the people are there thinking this is some supernatural activity of God. And I bring that up because there's many things in our lives where we look at, we know it never would have happened except for God. But looking at it from the outside, it's easy to sort of write it off and go, well, I, I kind of see where you might think that, but um, myself, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure about that. That's you. I'm going to live my life, and I'm not going to figure that out. And we have stuff like this happen all the time in our own lives. Uh, one such story that happened this week, and I was actually going to ask Moses to share this personally, but we're tight on time, so I'll just share this if it's okay about the car and the job. All right, so um, Moses and Th Cynthia, they've been sharing a couple times over the last couple months about how they've been waiting and then God has provided. And a while back, uh, Moses was talking about a job down south of town. It was a good job and then it didn't seem to work out. Well, this week, a couple things happened. One is God provided a car to Moses and Cynthia from one of you. So that's an awesome provision, and God was providing in ways, and also God was guiding the people who gave the car, so that's a just huge gift. And uh, I want to say thank you. It took a little while to get the title transferred, but eventually we got it done. The other thing that happened this week is Moses got a job at Michigan Turkey Processing Plant, right? So uh, now every day Moses is killing turkeys, right? <laughs> it's a little bit difficult, but like I said to him, you can just say to the turkey, look, it's either you or me, and it's not going to be me. Right? That's how that works. Uh, but the same day the car worked out, he got a call from the place down uh, south of town that's a better job, saying, hey, you're in the running, we'll, uh, we'll hook you up as soon as the job opening comes open. So that's another huge, huge gift, all in really a period of a couple days. And we could look at that and say, well, you know, people get jobs all the time, why is that so supernatural? But from Moses and Cynthia's perspective, that's pretty supernatural. Car, provision, jobs, hopes, and uh, it's just all sorts of things wrapped in together. It's a story of the supernatural. Hopefully, many of us have that in our lives all the time. Now, that's one story of the breaking of bread. Going to the New Testament, let's hear this story from Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus had heard what had happened, that is, John the Baptist had just been killed, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it is already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Uh, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. 
Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks and broke it. Then he gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Now this is a spectacular story. If you've been part of the church for a while, you've heard of this story for a long time, and it's always kind of interesting to think how this happened. If you haven't been part of the church for a while, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderfully spectacular story because you know approximately what it would cost to feed 5,000 people plus, men, plus women and children. This is a lot of food. There's an economic factor. There's a provision factor. It's a first-order miracle. And in the Bible, there's these huge first-order miracles, especially in the New Testament. Now, it's important to look at how this is similar to the Old Testament story. First of all, there's barley. There's barley loaves. I don't know if you noticed that before, but there's barley that's provided. It's not, a, it's not owned by the person who does the breaking. It's brought to the person who does the breaking of the bread. It's passed out. And in both, sex, both uh, stories, there's some left over. So you can't sort of do what I did in Sunday school when I was younger and said, when my Sunday school teacher asked me, hey, can you break uh, five loaves of bread and the pieces enough to feed 5,000 people and me being kind of a smart oh, you can break it up into 5,000 pieces. But the text says they were satisfied, right? They were satisfied and there's some left over also in both texts. But in the New Testament, the story is clearly superior because Jesus feeds 5,000 with fewer um, initial product of bread and there's fish too and there's uh, men and women and children it's people he wasn't directly responsible for it wasn't the company of the prophets there's a huge amount of provision for all people and then there's enough for all the disciples and of course at the end of the story I love this part just in case the disciples ever doubted this in the future they're all sitting there with a basket of pieces left over to look at in their hands God is clearly clearly doing something miraculous here. It shows, and what the, what the writer of Matthew is doing here, is he's showing that Jesus is clearly a new and better Elisha. Not only does he do miracles, he does every single miracle better than Elisha. He's a new and better prophet. And you see this, the healing of the sick, the, see, the seeing of the blind, the releasing of people from all sorts of diseases. Jesus is pictured as a new and better prophet, a new and better priest. And he's just a new and better everything than was in the Old Testament. But they recognized him, of course, because they have all these stories, these paradigms, if you will, in the Old Testament, what a prophet, what a priest and king looks like. And here comes Jesus along as a new and better prophet, the new and better king, the new and better priest. And he does all things in this amazing, spectacular way. And that's what brings us to this story here on Palm Sunday. Because Jesus had been healing people. He had been setting people free. He had been teaching as one who had authority, not just going back and forth in this rabbinical approach, comparing different interpretations and saying, well, so-and-so said, so-and-so said. He says, it is said, but I say. He taught with new authority, healed the sick. And as he did this, people got this expect expectation that perhaps... Just perhaps his kingdom was of this world and he was going to set them free, not only from their diseases and their sin, but from the very Roman con uh, conquest, the Roman Empire itself. So that day, as Jesus walked into, or, uh, rode into Jerusalem on a colt to full of a donkey, they knew that Jesus was something new. And in so many ways, they recognized him as a king. They shouted, Hoshana, Hoshana, which was a kingly welcome. Jesus riding in on a, on a donkey there was a symbol that he, in fact, was a king. It's what kings did. They rode into towns on, I think, mostly donkeys. I don't think they used horses for some weird reason, some weird cultural reason. Although even that's debatable because, you notice the play said the opposite. But that's how things work. So anyway, he's walking down, uh, riding down, and he comes into... Um, the temple in Jerusalem, and he's not only presents himself as a king, but then he's in the temple. What's he doing there in the temple in Matthew? He's giving sight to the blind, he's healing, and the children in the temple are still, still shouting, Hoshana, Hoshana, this is the son of David, son of David. And they're recognizing him as a king all over the place. And what would be bad about Jesus being king? I mean, wouldn't it be great to have a ruler who, in addition to doing administration well, you could walk up to him and say, Jesus, I got an eyesight problem. He'd be, no problem, you're healed. Jesus, I have a liver problem. He'd say, no problem, you're healed. Jesus, I don't understand this passage. And he could teach it in a huge new way that might take a long time to figure out. But again, he could teach in a new way that you never really heard before. Jesus would make a great king. But here's the thing about this passage. 
Jesus knew that they had real problems. They had sickness problems. They had a Roman problem. They had a law problem. They couldn't fulfill the law as they were called to do. And he was going to solve, he was willing to solve so many of those problems that he, when he was with them. But that day as he walked, as he rode into Jerusalem, he was prepared to solve a problem that was much deeper than any of them were ever willing to consider Jesus might be willing to solve. And it's a problem that all of us have. It's a problem with alienation from God. It's a problem that in addition to knowing the law, we can't do it. We can't do what we want to do in terms of living out our relationship with each other and with God. So Jesus rode into Jerusalem triumphant, but at the same time, he had the cross in mind, and he knew he would be sacrificed as the Passover lamb later that week so that all these people who wanted to make him king would actually be able to live in a relationship with God that wasn't always bound up with this sort of fulfilling the law and sacrifice and wondering if they're saved or not. He would be the final Passover sacrifice that would fulfill the law once and for all. And in so doing, he would solve a problem that all of us have that goes much, much deeper than we would ever dream of Jesus being willing to solve. And so we got to go to the last story of the breaking of bread in Scripture. And this is in Matthew 26. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says the appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So there was the Elisha story. There was the feeding of the 5,000 story. And all of a sudden we see this story. And miraculously, in a supernatural way, we now understand that we're part of the story of the breaking of bread. That Jesus has broken bread and offered it to us. We often think it would have been so great to be there on that hillside when he fed the 5,000. But in a huge, new, and better way, you are here. And Jesus has offered you his very self as spiritual nourishment, as spiritual life, so we can all partake of the body and blood of Jesus Christ spiritually and be fed. And there's some left over for the people who have not yet tasted. We've been talking about the supernatural. And the one thing about the supernatural is that we think, yes, Jesus is going to heal my disease or heal my thing, and we want God to do things on our timing, on our approach. But Jesus demonstrates clearly that suffering is part of the picture. And this morning, I want to show you a video that highlights how it's easy to say, yes, Lord Jesus, yes, Lord Jesus, solve all my problems right now. But this video shows how Jesus is with us in the midst of our suffering, doing things, providing in ways that only he can provide as we live our lives with him. So before Jesus left, the disciples knew, they didn't know, but Jesus knew that they were going to be left alone. And he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Please also believe also in me. And what Jesus does is he comes to us in the midst of our suffering and says, I don't guarantee that I'm going to take away everything, but I do promise to be with you. I do promise to be your king. There's a succession of verses, if you can bring up that PowerPoint again. He says, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He says, in this world you will have suffering. He may suffered in the last couple of weeks. He says, you will have trouble. You will have suffering, but take heart. 
I have overcome the world. And sometimes he chooses to heal and deliver and set free and just do amazing, obviously supernatural things. Sometimes he chooses to do more subtle supernatural things. And sometimes, like in this story, he allows us to suffer. And we don't know why, but in his provision, he eventually turns it out for good. What is faith? It says in Hebrews 12 that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the certainty of things not seen. It's a certainty in our heart. Not that God is going to do what we want, necessarily, but that he is with us and he is willing to be our king. This is another acronym. It's full assurance in the heart. Again, not that God is going to do what we want, necessarily, but that God is our king and he will be interactive in our life, doing what only he can do and in his wisdom knows what is best. Romans 8.28 is this just spectacular verse in a spectacular chapter. It says, In all things, God works for the good of those who seek him, who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. On this Palm Sunday, I want to invite you to put your faith in God in general, but in also in any particular area. And I want to ask the question this way. Where do you long to put your faith in God? Because often there's some part of our lives where we're holding on to pretty tight. We know what that is, but it's hard to let go of that. It's hard to give that to God. So I don't want you to do anything for my sake or even for your friend's sake or your family's sake. I want you to look in your heart and say, what do I long to give to Jesus as my king? And it might be something like your health. It might be something like your past. It might be something like your future. It might be something like your lack of resources. It might be something like too much resources. I can't tell you what it is, but listen to your heart. What do I long to put my faith in? What do I long to give to Jesus as my king? Turning over to him, allowing him to have total control, total ownership of, so I can live in a relationship with him. What do you long to give to Jesus? And if you'd like, during this next song we're going to sing, you're more than welcome to come up here and do something like that crowd did when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And you can take any scrap of paper from your bulletin and take one of those little pencils and write it out. And there's also papers up here. And if you like, while we're singing this song, you can just bring it right up and put it here with these palm branches as your palm. You don't have to do this, but if God is putting something on your heart, I want to encourage you to do this as a symbol that you are giving Jesus honor as the king over that area of your life or over your life as a whole.